I just think if you're going to come out here and do what your boss is doing and say that you know you're here to antagonize the world of MMA and you're here to antagonize MMA fighters and you're here to just sort of poke the bear. Listen, I'm not trying to say that I'm an MMA fighter. I've had one. You're clearly training with the best in boxing. So why don't we just make it happen? Why don't we sort of prove that this Jake Paul, Conor McGregor thing doesn't need to be a thing of fantasy? Why don't we set up the precursor for what your boss so clearly wants, a fight between the two? I'll I'll happily help you do that. We can be on an undercard. I don't mind. I'm not a big deal. I'll even let you be the A side um, because at the end of the day, I'll be the one coming out of the side on my feet and you'll be the one coming out on a stretcher. everyone and welcome back to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I have been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. My guest this week is the Mac Life guy, a friend of mine, uh-huh. a fellow Spurs fan. It's Oscar Willis. Oscar, how you doing my man? I'm good mate. Thank you very much for having me and being a long-suffering Tottenham fan as well. I appreciate that. So I think that, that brought us closer together over the years. Yeah, I think it's funny. You and me don't even talk much about combat sports when we text each other. It's always about Spurs, isn't it? Well, there's always so much to discuss when they're playing or doing anything or not doing anything or just, you know, making our lives a little bit harder. But yeah, you are usually my agony aunt about that, where it's just a lot of swear words and Daniel Levy and more swear words. Yeah, exactly. Um, Well, there's there's just so much to talk to you about, Oscar. Um, When I get members of the media on, that I've got a relationship with friends, peers, colleagues. Just for anyone that doesn't know, I always like to get the origin story, right? And obviously you've been affiliated with the Mac Life for for so long now, but I'd love to know what was life like before the Mac Life, before MMA media, before being involved in the business. What were you up to? What were you doing? And how did you get involved? So I was a builder in Kent in the UK. Um, which I was not very good at. I was like just a general labourer, a site, as they called me at the time. And then I just sort of was so bored of of the rain and just everything and just not really being happy with my lot in life that I I sort of thought, well, I was good at English at school. I could write a little bit. So uh, And then I started loving MMA. I was like, I'm going to try and go to America to university to, to pursue a career in MMA journalism. Complete like dream. Didn't really know what I was going to do. Just as like, if I could get to America, I reckon I'd be okay. I did that, got to, saved up some money, got to a university in America. And then while I was doing that, I saw this website, The Mac Life, and I was a massive, massive Connor fan. And I don't know why I did this. I just emailed the the website being like, hey, what does Connor have to do with this? Got talking to them and kind of cheekily was like, hey, if you need need someone, I'm here. And I think... um, very much a right place at the right time sort of deal when i just sort of once i got involved even slightly i knew it was a uh it was like just make the most of this opportunity and it will become something if i work hard enough but before that yeah it was mostly just being a builder drinking on the weekends the same old story you know you just work monday to friday and then go out friday and saturday night in in the uk and get up to no good and um It wasn't that I was unhappy necessarily, but I knew that it was either do this for the next 40 years or try and do something else and actually make something happen for me, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Were you a fan of the sport or were you just a Connor fan? Were you watching every UFC? What were you doing? No, I was one of the Brock Lesnar guys. So I was a WWE fan. And then when Brock came over, um, I think I, I watched this Heath Herrick fight. Uh, herring fight and that was that i was one of those guys i was one of those transplants that came over so once i did that then i started doing the thing where oh i recognize this chuck liddell guy i'll go and watch all of his fights and then through watching his fights it's like wow this guy he fought rampage he seems pretty cool then i watched all the rampage fights and that slowly but surely just watched every big name in the history so i was a i was a massive fan i moved to the states before connor so the reason why i decided i had to go to the states for this was because in 2012 i moved really wasn't a lot happening in uk mma i mean compared compared to now certainly and i just thought you know if you go to you know what is a fighters only or something you know how many people in this country are going to be buying for that one opportunity that one job so i thought if i can get to the us that's where mma is that's why i did it and then it was only you know a year later connor started emerging you know a year later connor started emerging but i was happy that i did it and i think you know 
regionally you see mma sort of influx you know you have these these peaks and valleys and obviously london and the uk right now is massively high but it made more sense for me to move over here um at that time anyway yeah we're gonna get to that as well because i feel like when people ask me for some advice i'm like look if you're young enough and you've got no obligations if you're able to move to vegas or new york or la (laughs) uh, one of those major hotspots, there's a good chance that you can figure out a way to get involved especially in vegas so we'll get to that a little bit later on so you joined the mac life what year oscar 2013 or 2014 it would have been ufc 200 no so maybe even later than that maybe in 2016 yeah ufc 200 was my first event for them so 2016 they started around the end of 2015 so i came on board pretty soon after that Uh, what were those early days like for you i mean manic i was still studying um but and this is going to sound insane and maybe mildly like unbelievable but at the time i was so sure right that you know, Connor's trajectory was this. And I knew that if you're attached to this, sky's the limit for this this outlet. So I was a bit of a fiend for it. So if I was at university and a story broke, I would just leave the class, go into the bathroom and write an article on my phone to publish that. And then for the first year, I set an alarm on my phone every two hours throughout the night so I could wake up, check to it and see if I'd missed a story from across the seas or not. I did that for about a year, not very healthy, but that was the sort of early days. I was so manic to just be quick and on top of everything because I felt that that was the only way you could really be worth anything if you're starting from nowhere. So I was really sort of obsessed with that. And and I think you've probably done the same as me where we're a bit of a curator, curators of content. And it's only over time you realize like, some content just is not going to hit and you can spend your energy elsewhere. But at that time it was anything, everything. John Fitch just did an interview with bjpen.com. You know, it's got 300 clicks to it. Bam, I'm on it. It was just, it was a uh, shotgun, at, you know, attitude. So early days, it was like that. And I was, I was still a writer. I wasn't really doing any sort of on-site event coverage over the first six months. So yeah, I just remember lots of frantic articles about stuff that probably didn't need to be that frantic. But at the time, it's good to motivation. And one of the things, and I think it's more prevalent now, more so than ever, is the ability to do anything, whether it's on camera, behind the camera, produce, write, social, you name it. What's that journey been like for you to obviously have the writing background, but then also develop being you know, being able to operate a camera, edit? Uh, understand how social media works things of that nature yeah so i when we did start covering live events um i got a camera and i didn't i didn't know anything right you know it's auto settings point it in a direction and hope for the best so i just spent i would spend my evenings like practicing i would film videos and try and edit it and i would try and set up shortcuts to make my editing process quicker and quicker just sort of make it work for me and i would spend you know two hours a day just trying to learn one thing on premiere or one thing on photoshop and just get good at that before i learned the best thing i think one of the things people do sometimes is they try and learn everything all at once and it's sort of overwhelming and you give up i think it's better to be like okay how do I make this video transition into this video? Work on that for about an hour, then try something else, you know, some basic stuff. So I used to just do that, just practice at, practice at night and try and just make my time quicker and quicker. And then I think, as you said, once you, you know, you can just do everything. I think once you get a basic, basic understanding of the basics of your video editing, of your, your graphic design stuff, then that can really expand to social. So I was never really into social. Once I got good at the basics of video and and photo editing, then it's, it's almost a natural progression, right? Because I think certainly for me anyway, I've really gone away from writing now. It, It doesn't really give me that sort of enjoyment in a weird way as much as maybe this is our attention spans falling to the wayside but getting a good graphic or reacting quick enough to make a graphic that i know is going to get good engagement that gives me a bigger buzz than writing a 500 word article about the same thing you know it's it's i think there's more creativity involved in it for me anyway so i've found that my interests over time have gone more towards the social side but i think to do that you have to have a real like concrete understanding of the basic stuff that'll help you with everything else when people do the mac life they think of you because you are so like associated with you know your bio says you are the Mac Life guy. But could you yeah. give some insight into the behind the scenes, the team setup? Because it's not like MMA junk you're fighting where there's massive no. teams and massive budgets. And it's incredible what you've been able to achieve over the course of this run. But what are the behind the scenes like for the Mac Life? 
yeah, so I've got my my managing director, Lee Dunphy. He's the boss. And then I work with John Balfe. He's a writer. So we have the website, themaclife.com. He will be the one doing those articles. Um, and we've had some people come and go, graphic design teams and stuff like that. Currently, I am the guy. So I do the YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok uh and instagram right so if you see a bit of content with the mac life logo if it's not written it's probably done by me um and i've often been pushed by lee to sort of bring more people on board but i'm a bit of a control freak and if i was going to give myself one pat on the back i'm very quick at doing stuff and sometimes if you're the guy sitting at home and you're thinking why isn't this up yet you can get a bit frustrated with another party and I've, and sometimes as well, uh, you know, it can take, take me as long to teach you this as just doing it myself. So I'm a bit of a control freak and I do need to, this year I've pledged to sort of let go of that and try and broaden the team. But behind the scenes, that's what it's like. It's me and Lee in constant communication about, should we go to this event? Should we cover this guy considering what he said in the past about certain things? And, you know, it's a bit more complex than your junkies and your fightings. It's a much more streamlined approach, but it does work for us. And um, as you mentioned earlier, when younger people ask for advice, I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty free and able to move around and travel a lot. So I'm going to just try and make the most of that while I can. So it kind of works like that. It's incredible what you do as a, a one-man band on the social side. Do you ever fear burnout? Have you had cases where you have just totally oh, burned out? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not even that long ago. You know, it, what I've learned is with burnout is it tends to come and go, right? You can be burnt. So I was fairly like, I, I've got to be honest, and everyone always sort of looks at you kind of bemused by this, but sitting at the apex watching you know, number 15 fighting number 17th ranked in the world. It's not like the best thing I could be doing with a Saturday night sometimes. You know, I could have be going to weddings or stuff like that. You know, there are things I could be doing with my life. So if you do too many of those events that don't really sort of get you good return on views or get you sort of excited as a, as a fight fan, you know, those can sort of burn you out, especially if you have to fly to like Moncton, Canada or wherever it is to do that. But then, so I was kind of dealing with a bit of like clock in, clock out. But then you have uh, Diaz versus Paul right before Salt Lake City with Dustin and Justin. And then three weeks later, you have Sean O'Malley. And suddenly I'm right back in. And now I'm cutting everything. Now I'm back passionate. And, I, and uh, this last quarter of the year, I can see myself really working much harder than I did the second quarter of the year. Because when you're a fan of something and it's exciting to cover it, it's not work at all. You know, it's something I would enjoy doing. When it's something like, I always use this as an example, and it's probably a bit harsh, but like Jessica Rye fought Cynthia Calvillo. It wasn't like I was sprinting to the apex that day during a pandemic. I didn't know what was going on. It was just, do you know what I mean? Like, it sounds a bit harsh on those, but when you have like a John Jones fight, something that, that it gives me adrenaline like nothing else does, you know, in terms of work. So I'm really excited and to deal with the burnout. I think the only thing I've ever found is just, keep sort of going stay disciplined don't be too lazy try and hold yourself to a standard and eventually for me at least it comes around and you'll find some passion for it again sooner or later yeah i, was, I think you've basically answered my follow-up question is uh, i was kind of curious to find out what, what's driving you and if what was motivating you initially at the mac life perhaps has changed in recent years yeah i think for me uh i'm deceptively competitive you know i'm i'm I can, I can find, I, I just surprise myself sometimes where I say someone else gets more views than me, it'll actually kind of really piss me off in a way that I didn't, didn't anticipate. But also I, I think maybe you're similar to me where I'm a bit of a numbers guy. I'm an analytics guy. Like I really love reading that stuff, the reading the back end stuff, seeing what clicks, what doesn't sort of working out trends. And I think working with social or YouTube, one of the best things about it is I can see numbers you know so i can see what gets engagement so if this gets this much engagement i can then sort of compete with myself onto how to make that click even more you know um so that motivates me or knowing that if i just stay awake for another four hours tonight a post fight on a you know so after the pay-per-view if i do that i know these videos are going to grow the channel and it's so that motivates me to do that to see the actual numbers go up that's that's something that that motivates me it's a little bit nerdy but it's the thing that always sort of i can come back to and it's absolutely quantifiable evidence that what i'm doing is working and paying off do you have a favorite moment uh, or a favorite event or a piece of content 
um, that you've you know curated or provided for the Mac life over this run that you're you're kind of deeply proud of? Yeah, I mean, I think you're probably the same as me, right? The the UFC schedule is so relentless; it doesn't really offer us much time to sort of stop and appreciate a moment. Um, I'm trying to get better at that. Funny enough, in Boston when Sean O'Malley uh, beat Aljamain, the crowd was so crazy for so long, like five minutes after the initial referee had waved off. I even tapped Jose Youngs on the shoulder and I said, pointed at the crowd. I was like, remember this one. Like this is a this is a crazy reaction. I actually took a minute to sort of take it in. In terms of content I produced, um the the pub talks I do with Dan and and I'd done a couple with Connor and stuff. I'm really proud of those because I think it's there was a something of a gap in the market for that sort of casual lad culture talk. And I'm I'm it's who I am at my most natural. So I enjoy doing those the most. I'm, I'm really proud of those. And those are when people come up and compliment you on stuff. And they specifically mention that that gives me like a, a really warm feeling. And uh, another one that kind of flew under the radar, but I was able to interview Chael and Anderson Silver at the same time and get them to talk about their history. And I was the biggest Chael Sonnen fan like the biggest guy and obviously his fights with Anderson are so monumentous to me that having them both next to me was just a real like oh this is pretty cool moment so those are a couple of the ones that stand out but the pub talk series is something that I I love to do and um continue to be passionate about yeah you mentioned Connor a few times there I'm curious to know how that relationship has developed over the years you know you going from a Connor fan to him being your ultimate boss yeah yes uh it's fun man it was you know connor's a a it it always surprises people how deeply engaged connor can be you know certainly early on as we were growing the mac life and i think there was an element of like he he wanted to be more involved to make sure it was going the direction he wanted it you know you type the wrong word in an article you'll hear about it and i do mean that sort of level of specificity like he he was on top of you um at all times of the night so that was fun but then over time i think as my you know as my sort of that sounding like a bit of a wanker like my stature in the the sport has grown to a certain extent and the fact that i'm constantly working constantly churning out content um he he's been nothing but great to me you know and every time i see him now it's it's a hey a little catch up and um he's been great you know he's he he knows i was a fan of his and i think he's I think he just he really the the team around him because of the nature of his life and his existence and just how full on it is all the time everyone around him works insanely hard and I think he's aware of that you know I think he knows that these guys are putting in the hours so you know I can respect that because I put in the hours so he's he's always been great for me and um it's always you know it's always a little bit like dealing with a hurricane you know at the bare knuckle when he just suddenly showed up i was like oh here we go and it's just balls to the wall but it's it's obviously fun and um he still has that aura you know whenever you're around him so it's cool it's fun to talk to the human but it's also fun to see the the reaction to him you know i when i was in the black forge last time and he was there one of my favorite things to do is you'll see these like american tourists come in and then they'll see him and you'll just see them have a brain meltdown and i always find that so funny because he'll kind of he's just in his pub right and it's fun to watch fans interact with him on that level because he's always just very uh, jovial and stuff and but yeah it's cool i'm rambling a little bit but yeah it's it's been a surreal but cool experience no, and he's been public with this as well. He's bigged you up on social media, yeah. you know, quite a few times. It's incredible I think to once see. Ba- I think once based on your tweet, I think you asked him if Tottenham <laughs> would win the league and he went, oh, I don't know about Tottenham, but Oscar's great or something like that, which I was like, yeah. thanks, Sandy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, he's been cool. Yeah, I said earlier on, you know, when, you, when I think of, you know, top tier premium on-site coverage, I think of MMA Junkie and MMA Fighting because, like I said, they've got the staff, they've got the budgets, they've pretty much got someone based in in every locale and then they usually have someone that will travel to every pay-per-view. But you're, the Mac Life is right up there, neck and neck with these guys when I think of, like I said, the best content that you can get from on-site coverage. At what point did you say to yourself, did you think, or did you know rather, that, okay, We've taken the Mac Life as a brand, as a social media outlet, as a website, to the level where it is up there with a junkie and a fighting, given the fact that it's just you, a writer and a line manager with D. Dumphy. Yeah, it was, uh, it's funny, I can actually remember a specific moment where 
Um, we were in Melbourne, Australia, I think for Israel versus Rob. And, you know, John Morgan used to bring the the mic stand for everyone. And there was only three mics in it. And it was a junkie mic, a fighting mic, and the Mac Life mic. And I remember looking at that and being like, hmm, I, rem- I remember that so well. I was thinking, okay. And then um, I'm going to sound like such a petty dick here, but obviously I check the numbers for everyone. Like I don't just check my numbers. I'll go on other websites, go on other YouTube channels and check their numbers, just sort of see what's working for everybody. And, uh, you know, there would be times where Emily fighting blew us away or junkie blew us away. And then uh, that gap sort of got is smaller and smaller. And I, I think it just over time, just, I think John Morgan used to be this guy and I did, I've told him I've modeled myself after him and his sort of initial career and what he wanted to do, but times where I would do things that I don't think many others would do. Like I flew to Sweden to talk to Hamzat for five minutes and flew back to Vegas the same day. And like, obviously that's, I flew. And then one time I flew from Vegas to London, landed in London, saw an announcement for the Mazda Ideas press conference, and then just got back on a plane without leaving the airport to New York. So stuff like that, that I didn't think other people do. When I do that, I think, okay, I'm either gaining on you or I'm taking away from you. But moments like that is where I think, especially for one, for, for me doing it, I'm like, okay, we're on a level or we're, we're, trying to take over you know to take past you but certainly the the mic flag moment when i saw all three of us together i was like oh pretty cool <laughs> yeah uh, and you mentioned earlier on you know you did move to vegas um i'm just curious to know well first of all i'm jealous because even though i live in toronto and i love the the time zone compared to what i was used to oh, in the yeah. uk i'm still a little bit, bit more jealous of everyone that lives on the west coast uh but i am just kind of curious you know what how has living in vegas impacted your life both professionally but as also personally as well yeah it's funny you mentioned the time zones i was a bitter little bitch in boston i was so grumpy about this eastern time zone it's only three hours i was like i can't believe this um yeah i mean i got really like i moved to vegas for the mayweather fight with connor in 2017 um and a girlfriend had just thrown me out and I was like, well, I may as well just stay in Vegas then. Seems like a good place to be single. So I stayed in Vegas. And then I would say it was like pretty normal because at that time it was just, the UFC wasn't even here. They didn't have the apex and stuff. But when COVID hit, being one of the few people here, that was a game changer, you know, because I was probably one of six people who had regular access to everything they did. The tent outside the apex I was in for about half a year. That was you know, there would have been people, Jesus, Mike Bond would have killed me if he could have had that spot. You know, there'd have been people who were stuck at home who just could not get there. And I just happened to be lucky enough to be where it all was kicking off. So that for me was a moment where it was a bit like, oh, all the decisions I've made up to now really are paying off right now because, you know, I felt so bad for a lot of those guys, even people living in LA, you know, it was like, just, you couldn't go to work. And I was lucky enough to be one of the people who was just regularly covering events. And even not to talk about the pandemic at all, but like, you know, when you're desperate for some sort of normality, being able to go to work was probably great for me personally as well. Cause I was grumpy. I mean, we were all miserable during that time. So just the ability to have that here made anything to be in Vegas worth it, you know? Well, this is going to be my next question. Just laying me up with a segue because I felt like it was really during the pandemic where I could count on one hand how many outlets I could go to for that on-site coverage. And it wasn't just the Apex. You were going to Fire Island regularly. And when Florida opened up, you were still one of the very few people that were... What was that whole experience like? Not just being in Vegas, but just traveling, you know, in unison with the UFC and being that traveling circus for a couple of years. It it was wild, man, and it was. It's one of those things that I feel like collectively as a society we've all sort of been like, let's forget those two years ever happened, you know. So when I sit and think about it, I'm like, Jesus, we really did that. I spent I've spent over a hundred days of my life in Abu Dhabi. It's wild, but uh, I remember feeling that that time, the level of uncertainty going to Abu Dhabi, it really brought everyone kind of closer together and that includes ufc staff and the media who are going and i know there's some media out there who really don't don't like the idea that you can potentially be friends that you're with people that you're around sometimes but um it really did because it was all you know it was all wild it was constant tests constant stuff like that being in this bubble it felt like going to summer camp you know after five weeks you hate everyone you're around because you haven't been able to get away from them 
um, it was just a very intense experience that I think just sort of made you all appreciate that what we do is is not that serious. Like we're not dealing with Donald Trump's tax returns here. We're watching men and women punch each other in the head. And I think it just sort of made us appreciate that you don't need to treat this as if it's life and death. You can treat this like it's a kind of weird and wacky sport with a weird and wacky crew that go around with it. Um, so that was my takeaway. I made like a lot of friendships with people over that on that experience and fire island was something i will never want to do again because it was just so ridiculous but at the same time you know while i was on fire island like having a beer with everyone everyone else was at home stuck at the house right so i was very appreciative of it uh i just wish it could have maybe been in like miami or you know mexico somewhere like that but you know it was a good time it was just wild man it was it, being one of the very few to experience that from start to finish i didn't miss one thing um during covid it means i feel not in a superior way but i feel very lucky to be part of a very select group of people who can say to each other like jesus do you remember when that happened oh my god yeah you know even the first the first jacksonville one where with uh Gage and ferguson i remember being in this massive arena and i felt like a billionaire like these fights were just on for me i was like with me and 20 people in a huge arena watching these fights i was like this is pretty cool and i got emotional i remember being emotional i was like oh my god we're gonna carry on life is gonna continue it was wild man crazy experience yeah i feel like at this point you're one of the people in the media that's probably been to more events and had more on-site experience than veterans that have been covering the sport for maybe twice as long as you have just because of how many events you've been to in such a condensed period of time um one of the things that I've learned to know about you is you loved to experience life. You know, there's nothing that <laughs> there's probably nothing that you wouldn't try at least once just to say, you know what, I did that. Um, and yeah. one thing that yeah. springs to mind right away is having a fight, actually mm. getting in the cage yourself, which I can't think of many of the members of the media. There's like maybe one or two others. That's it. That have actually, you know, put in the camp, yeah. trained for a fight, had a fight booked and actually done it. Why did you do this, Oscar? I've all, I always wanted to. My whole thing was I'm going to have a fight by the age of 30. And then the pandemic happened. So it got put off by a year or two. Um, but I always wanted to do one. I don't even read. I couldn't even sit here and tell you why. I just always thought like, I'll have a go at that. But as you were kind of alluding to, I just sort of thought, yeah, okay, that'll be right. And then it was really the process of it. You know, this is such a cliche, but you do get a bit more understanding of the guys, I, I I remember after like after the sixth week of training or something, I was like, no, I'd be juicing. This is so hard. Like this recovery sucks. So um, I remember that, but I also had to train while I was on the road and that made it more challenging. But as I was saying earlier about, um, the, you know, flying places and coming back earlier, the the fact that I was doing it on the road kind of gave me more of a buzz for it because I was like, oh, no one else would try and do this, like to try and work full time away from the gym while still trying to train for it. So I got a bit of a buzz off that. And it was only really after the fight itself that I saw the reaction. I was like, oh, like this was something that was appreciated by much more people than I thought it was going to be. Uh, so it was never really with that in mind. It was always just, it was always just something as simple as I should probably do that one day and then I just did it. It wasn't really didn't think it through, never really thought about what could happen or anything. I just thought I should do it. And, and it just kind of worked out like that, luckily. What was it training and putting in the camp? And also, what was it like actually on fight night stepping into the cage? Yeah, the, the camp was wild. Like the amount of things that happened to me that could have like completely screwed the fight up is crazy. So the amount that must happen to professionals who are training with professionals is ridiculous. Like, Something as simple, I was in Arizona and a spider bit me and my arm swelled up to three times the size and I couldn't punch with it for like a week. And that was three weeks from fight night. Then two weeks from fight night, a guy broke my nose, completely inspiring to the point where I couldn't really breathe through it. And I knew I had to fight in two weeks. It was all this crazy stuff that was just like, oh my God, like how do these guys do this and carry on? But sort of once you put it out there, you kind of got to see it through, you know? So that was the training was really stressful, like going to a new city, trying to find a gym, tr paying a week's membership, which is not that cheap, and having to do that like every single week for I think 20 weeks is how long I did it. 
it was like a lot. Um, but I think if I didn't have the pressure, I wouldn't have done it as well. You know, if I, if I had been at home, I think I wouldn't have had this concept of he's definitely training more than me right now. So I got to get out there and start training. I think I'd have probably been a bit more lazy. And then the fight night itself, um, I wasn't nervous at all. I was just so like ready to do it. I was like, okay, let's just go do this. And then I thought on the walkout, I asked a guy for advice. He'd fought before and he said, just like try and enjoy it. Don't try and be overawed by the moment. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll just pretend I'm having a really good time, even if I'm scared so that like I'll trick myself. So I came out dancing, was talking to John Morgan in the commentary booth throughout the fight. Like I was just, I told, I was pretending I was having a good time when actually I was just thinking, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I'm so tired, but it worked out, you know, like it, 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 I really, it was all a bit of a weird one, to be honest. It never really sunk in what I was doing. It just, even afterwards, I was just like, oh, it's finished. It was strange, very strange experience. It's so unique. It's really hard to explain. Just a very unique experience. I'm glad I did. That weekend, I can't remember now what other events were happening. UFC, Bellator, PFL, boxing. I don't know. But your fight was the one I felt yeah. like members of the media were most looking forward to that weekend. Did Did you feel as though this um, brought you closer to any fighters? Or did you have fighters reach out to you? Did it gain a different level of respect that you have for what fighters actually put in, in terms of camps and fights and stuff? Yeah, it's impossible to do. It's impossible to train two times a day for 20 weeks without getting a level of appreciation because you just become so sore and fairly miserable. And it's just, you're just like, can't turn your neck this way and stuff like that. Like you can't do it and not appreciate these guys doing it at a level a hundred times uh, more stressful than you. So I definitely came away with appreciation for that. And I think, yeah, it would be wrong to say guys didn't appreciate it too. Israel DM'd me about it. Gilbert Burns was complimentary. Like a, a bunch of guys were really, uh, they're really cool about it. And it was, that wasn't why I did it. Like I said, I didn't really realize the reaction I was going to get until afterwards. But once I got it, I was appreciative, but I'm also really like, I want to be very, I want to be very sort of self-aware that I'm not getting carried away here. Right. I don't, you know, these guys are complimenting me and stuff, but at no point did I ever feel like I should start carrying myself as if I'm one of the guys. I always wanted to just be like, thank you. I appreciate that you appreciate it, but Let's not lose perspective here. So I, I did have a few messages. I was very, very grateful for them. Um, but I think basically, if you're going to put it in a brief summary, like it made me appreciate how good I am compared to how these guys are. You know, so it was just, it was a real eye opener in terms of, oh, these guys, their lives get in the way of their career so much and we never know about it. And we don't realize like how miserable they are going into that cage and, we still get on Twitter and criticize these people. And I just sort of gave me an appreciation of like, sometimes maybe what you don't know, you don't know. And so if someone has an off day, you can't really just say that you don't know what they've been dealing with. Well, all the respect in the world from me um, to do that. I would never do it personally. Um, so I was going to cheering you on and I'm so happy that you got your hand <laughs> you. raised there in victory. So at the time I'm thinking, all right, well, Oscar's done it. Check, you know, uh, combat sports uh, experience in the books. And then recently in Boston during the UFC 292 press conference day, I see you post a video on social media and it's you having uh, well i guess approaching rather derek from mm. better media <laughs> can you share what went down during that conversation and why you approached him? Yeah, I mean, it, I feel like it's such a bell end about it now, really. But so he, I, I, re, I was one of the one of these traditionalists that really didn't like the way he was going to press conferences with Nate and saying a load of stuff that he couldn't face any repercussions from because he's surrounded by security. I just thought it was. It's, it's ironically, I thought it was a bit of a bully tactic. You know, you're insulting these people. You don't have to face repercussions about it. It just annoyed me. Um, so that got in my head. And then he posted a picture of himself in boxing gloves. And I was like, oh, so if this guy's going to fight, I was like, I'll fight him. McGregor, Jake Paul, there's a crossover there. I thought realistically, there's a chance I could I could get this fight. 
So I DM'd him. I was qu- I was I was quite hammered, but I DM'd him a few times. I put some stuff out on social media, then went to sleep, and then woke up and was like, "Oh yeah, I forgot I did that." Whoops. Uh, but then I th- so then on Boston Fight Week, Ian Gary signed with Better, and I thought, I tell you what, I'll try asking Ian about it. Maybe that'll get some traction. And then that didn't really work. And then I saw him in in the crowd at the ceremonial weigh-ins, I think it was, maybe the press conference. And I, d- I didn't even think about it. I didn't ask anyone to film it. I just went over and I just wasn't aggressive. I was like, are you going to fight? He said, yes. And I said, we should fight. And I think as soon as I did that, I kind of got the impression from him that he was not very interested in that. I kind of suspect he's not really interested in fighting at all. Um, and I said to him, I was like, listen, McGregor, Jake Paul, like we could do this. And he sort of um and and walked away. And uh, I actually felt quite bad because I was like, oh, I'm, I'm a lot heavier than him. And uh, I could tell from his demeanor that he really sort of didn't want it at all. So I sort of walked away. All the the sort of anger I had towards him about insulting our heroes and stuff, that kind of just went away. I realized it's the kid doing a bit, in my opinion. And I sort of was just like, whatever. Uh, and then uh, Medra the Media had filmed it. And I was like, send us that. And I wasn't going to post it. Then I went out. Then I had a few cocktails. And then I was like, all right, I will post it. I put it on my story. And then someone who will remain nameless but has a very large profile DM me and went, get that out now, yeah? And then so I put that out on a, on the Mac Life and, you know, nothing came of it. I uh, Great for clout, if we're going to be honest. But I think uh, I would love to have done it. I really would. And I do have some other ideas about where I could maybe get another fight. Um but I don't think it's going to happen. Oh, I, don't what a think. Sh- I know it would have been cool though. I mean, what have you made of him? Because I've only, I don't follow him on social media. I don't follow his content at all. Um, it's not for me personally. Um, yeah. But just those two interactions at the Paul Diaz press conferences, you know, mm-hmm. I'm assuming you were there at both press conferences, correct? Yeah. 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 I was there. When you you know turn to your left or turn to your right and you see what he's saying to, to Nate, um, you know, given you know how you've come up in the game and you know who you know you mentioned John Morgan as a mentor who obviously was a mentor to me as well, you know, what do you make of that? Is this just a, a peek into where media and combat sports specifically is is headed? Is it just a one off with what the better guys are doing? What's your take on that? No, I think it's probably the natural progression of things. Um, I think even, I don't want to start naming names, hitting on people, but I think if you look over the past even three years, even in MMA, not even with the YouTube boxing stuff, there have been guys who popped up who have a shtick or have a gimmick and some of them pull it off and then some of them don't. And, you know, you get, you've seen more and more um, guys show up at press conferences to try and get an altercation with a fighter on stage, a verbal altercation, so they can post it on their Instagram. Um, you've seen that happen, certainly when it's a big name like Connor or something, right? You get these guys who go up to try and get a moment. So I think based on that, it's kind of the natural progression that, okay, you're if you're someone on the outside and you see that, you think that's the thing to do and you don't really have much creative thought, okay, so I don't know how to get into this altercation, so I'll do, uh, I could beat you up off knock you out you know it's like that's it just gets to that sort of level of simplicity i think that's where we are my personal issue with it wasn't even was the when he said without getting too inside baseball here like nick diaz is not like i I think everyone knows nick diaz has some personal like stuff going on i don't think we could all say he's in the peak of health so when you're starting to say like you know you're going to fight a legend who might be dealing with some stuff? It's like, mate, just shut up. You don't even know you're. You don't even know what you're talking about. That kind of really irritated me. And then the next one, I was just pissed off because it's like, yeah, why are we letting this happen again? You know, again because he can't face any repercussions. If Nate jumped off stage and smacked him, he'd have been like, fair enough. But um, yeah. So I don't like that. And but I think honestly, like we, you know, we we saw Logan Paul and Dylan Dennis. I think for a certain age group, that's the new thing i think it's attention over anything else i actually think derek from better would probably have been punched in the face by nate diaz as long as it was filmed you know he would have been knocked out for the attention it would have got him that's the sort of vibe i get from these guys i think even ian gary you could argue that he's like the conor mcgregor for a younger generation you know he's like the more brash the more confident the more self self self-praising kind of guy I, i just think it's 
you know, you don't want to sound like the old man here, but to me, it's the natural progression of the TikTok generation. You know, just everything needs to be louder, more grabby, more incendiary, and just more, you know? Yeah. I've seen Derek's social media profile. It does appear as though he wants a fight, okay? Um, do you have a message for him? If he's watching this, <laughs> it's something we can clip off for social. What is your message? Just, let's give it one more shot. You versus Derek from Better Media, what's the message? I just think if you're going to come out here and do what your boss is doing and say that you know you're here to antagonize the world of MMA and you're here to antagonize MMA fighters and you're here to just sort of poke the bear. Listen, I'm not trying to say that I'm an MMA fighter. I've had one. You're clearly training with the best in boxing. So why don't we just make it happen? Why don't we sort of prove that this Jake Paul, Conor McGregor thing doesn't need to be a thing of fantasy. Why don't we set up the precursor for what your boss so clearly wants, a fight between the two? I'll I'll happily help you do that. We can be on an undercard. I don't mind. I'm not a big deal. I'll even let you be the A side um, because at the end of the day, I'll be the one coming out of the side on my feet and you'll be the one coming out on a stretcher. Love it. I'm going to clip that off of social. Um, <laughs> Oscar, this has been so much fun. Before I let you go, um, we'd love to just get your take on a few big fights. I actually don't sure. see you that often. I think the last time I saw you was maybe in Salt Lake City when Leon did the business. Uh, but I am looking forward to being in That was a good York. time, actually. We that went was to a that great really time. Like, grimy club. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I will be in New York in in, uh, in not nice. too distant future for the the UFC's 30th anniversary show. We'd love to get your your thoughts, maybe a prediction if you're willing to give it for John Jones versus Stipe Miocic at UFC 295. I think I'm uh, I'm in the general camp, right? I think I'm in the camp where Stipe has fought increasingly more and more sparingly over the past few years. His last appearance was a bad, bad knockout. And I think John Jones looks like he hasn't really lost a step. I think Stipe will probably, will certainly give John more trouble than Cyril, but I'm expecting John to win that fight looking fairly dominantly and then retire in the cage and make all of us wish we had some more. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same camp as well. Um, I mean, it's just too perfect. New York, 30th anniversary show. Yeah. You know, you, you take out the the quote unquote goat heavyweight. I mean, what more is there to do, yeah. honestly, at this stage? Well, then, um, then again, he he might get the tax bill from New York and think he should fight one more time. <laughs> you never know. You may. Who knows? Um, but prior to that, we've got Francis Ngannou versus Tyson Fury. By the way, are you planning on being there for that one? Yes, I will try and go there. Okay, amazing. Um, that seems like as though it's going to be a spectacle, to say the least. Um, yeah. Do you do you give Engano any chance whatsoever? Do you even think he'll be competitive against Fury? I just, it's, it's. I mean, the answer is obviously you're meant to say no, right? It's just it, it's kind of we almost we saw this fight happen already, you know, with Fury and, and Wilder. That's the sort of the, the what the sort of thing people say. I mean really a lot of it kind of re relies on fury is fury gonna train like this as a proper fight or is he just gonna think that um oh my siri just came off for some reason right the the thing is 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 all on fury is fury gonna train like this is a proper fight or is he just gonna think that it's easy money and then he'll go in there and suddenly francis who has been training like it's the most big opportunity of his life can grab him and, and hurt him it's it's kind of for me on fury i've been watching the netflix documentary he does seem incredibly mentally ill sometimes um but then again he's never he's never shone away from it has he he's he's always shown up and he's always delivered so no i don't give francis any real chance i think he'll walk out the ring happy either way um but i think if fury just basically didn't train a day you never know right that's heavyweights my final question, Oscar. Spurs. Know, what? How? How? Okay. For some reason, my audio has changed. I don't know what's going on here. No worries. Oh no, you're back. You're back. Sorry. Apologies. All right. So I would love to get your thoughts on Spurs this year, mate. Big Daddy Ange. How are you feeling? I know it's super early, but what are your thoughts about Spurs' uh, potential for this season coming up? I think we'll probably win the league, Sandy. Um, I don't know, man. It's it's. I was so pissed about how he left um i think i may have mentioned it to you uh especially the timing of it i was very not happy about it and then one game later one good game you're like ah he was holding us back really uh i think 
after the dredge that we've had the last few seasons with defensive football and or not even defensive football because we leaked more goals than anyone else but you know just like really pragmatic football i'm happy for a season where it's just all all systems go just fly forward and i think Ange is refreshingly very australian but refreshingly not media trained you know he just sort of talks like how he wants to talk and i think that for me has been the most refreshing thing i hate it when you get guys just come out and give their sort of basic statement and stuff he is thoughtful thought provoking and just honest and i think that is the thing i've missed the most so i don't mind if we don't if we lose games and stuff as long as he can comfort me afterwards and tell me that this is the reason why this is what's happening this is what we're going to do to change it i'm really excited i i think it's it's almost a very big hard reset from the Conte Mourinho Nuno period. And I think I feel the excitement back. You know, the atmosphere at the 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 lane seemed unbelievable against United. I was so jealous I wasn't there. But yeah, I don't know if you feel the same, but for me it's it's like a breath of fresh air, right? It's like, okay, we are starting now. You know, like we can start to enjoy our club again. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. You know, one good result, you know, you beat Man United at home, keep yeah. a clean sheet and, you know, look, you know, pretty, pretty decent uh, when we're attacking. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this could be something here. So, yeah, so let's the, see. And the, the thing I like the most about that is those bitter little is Keen and Neville. Like, oh, they're being <laughs> arrogant playing like this. Yeah, well, we put two past you, so why don't you relax? <laughs> and also the things your clubs have been doing recently, you should chill out too, but anyway. It's only Tottenham, lads. Yeah, yeah. It's only, well, when Keane said, oh, I think I think Man United are the new Tottenham, I was like, oh, it's such a perfect insult because I know how much you hate it. So good. That's so good about that. Uh, I tell you, Oscar, you know, and I think I'm pretty confident that you feel the same way. This is a volatile business that we work in, uh, but I have a, a special place in my heart for the European crew that pretty much all kind of came up together during a certain time and a certain era of the sport. Um, some are still working, some are, you know, it's still a bit of a side hustle, some aren't working at all. It's just great to see you thriving, it really is. Thanks, uh, and, and you're a great example of someone that, you know, shot his shot, um, got some reps, leveled up, made it a bold move to to relocate to Las Vegas and look at you now, you're, you're living the dream. Like you said earlier on, you know, you know, even when you're feeling like you're burning out, you're doing this because you're passionate about it and you love it. And most of the time it doesn't really feel like work. And I feel the exact same way. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Best of luck with the Mac life. Uh, best of luck with pub talk and best of luck with everything else that you are going on, honestly. So it's a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. Thanks, man. I feel the same. Like you said, like I, I, both of us love Abby, you know, Chisanga, Jim Edwards, all these guys who've just been around and, you know, it's, I think we're, we're pretty good about not being like nationalistic in the UK media, but it's, it's always fun to see. I remember you talking to you when you made your move and you know, everything you've been doing and stuff. I, I think it, it's nice to really mean it where you like, I, I don't want anything but success for that guy or these people. And it's nice because you can be competitive, but to, to see someone else flourish, I think it's awesome. So I, I feel the same with you, mate. Much love, Oscar. And hopefully I'll see you sooner rather than later, my man. Yeah. New York. Let's get it. <laughs> Let's get it. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.